behalf of the Bowling Green Common Presbyterian Church, we want to welcome all of you, who, as well as those who faithfully continue to watch us online. Our flowers on the altar table this morning are given in honor of Joe Curry Singh, given with love by Brad and Diane Clark. And uh, uh, so, <coughs> Paula Druin, all of us will remember Paula Druin here this, this Friday. She has a biopsy done, and so we ask that you remember her. Charlotte Burles continues to remain in the medical center in room 5802. And Mike Howard will have surgery this Tuesday at the medical center. We ask that you remember Betty Ackridge Turner. Uh, she's been coming to church here for a while with Terry Nunn. Uh, her mother died at the age of 95 this past week, and her funeral services are at Parrot and Ramsey in Campbellsville, Kentucky. Uh, visitation, and this is Eastern Time at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, and the service will be at 11 o'clock following an hour's visitation, and then there will be a graveside service the next day in Campbellsville. I believe that's all the announcements I have. Are there other announcements that need to be shared? If not, as we begin our morning worship, let us remember that Jesus is the one we cling to in these moments of uncertainty. And when everything seems to be fraying at the edges, we are a people who cling to the faithfulness of Almighty God. As the hymn was played right before worship began, it reminds me of the words of one of the verses when it says, Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine, 10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness, almighty God. So as we worship, let us gather together. Let us cling to the words of that great hymn of faith and to the purpose and to the great passion of our God. Let us worship. church is one foundation. Wasn't that a beautiful song? And because the church is one foundation, we are here together today to say, get all excited. Tell everybody that Jesus is still the King of Kings. Right. 
holy and eternal God, God of justice and God of glory, be with us, O oh God, this day in worship. Fill us with your presence and guard our hearts as we walk towards your kingdom and the vision for this world. We pray that as we sing and join together our voices in worship, that we will lift up praise to your holy name, that our lives will be touched by the power of your spirit, so that when we leave this morning, you will send us out to whatever place you have for us in the world to serve, so that we might be your ambassadors. For we pray and ask these things in the strong and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning to all of you who are here in this sanctuary this morning, and I hope that song will make your heart beat just a little faster, because we are here this morning to celebrate God and to thank Him for all that He's done for us. And it is during this time that we lean on God, that He is our strength. And that's why we're going to be singing, Leaning on the Everlasting arms because this old song has so many truths in it but we're going to do something a little bit different today all of you who are watching either on facebook or at home you have a special part your part you sing at home you say when we get to the chorus leaning on jesus leaning on jesus so that's your part at home here we sing leaning on the everlasting arms we'll never know how this comes out together but we're going to have a chorus of all of you at home and all of us here all right leaning on the everlasting <coughs> arms what a fellowship
started with the children's lesson, uh, I'm going to talk about the Valentine's Day fundraiser again. Uh, we have a youth fundraiser going on, and if you haven't got one of these lovely flyers with Valerie the Valentine's Day vulture on it, um, Garth has them, and you don't want to miss it. This is a modern art masterpiece put together by yours truly. Uh, but delivery for flowers is $10, and if you want to up it a little bit, the candy bouquet and stuffed animal delivery is $20. All candy bouquets are made by the students. So if you want the students to really work for it, you'll order a candy bouquet. Um, but you must order by February 9th, or else um, we will not make them, and I will not drive it to whoever you want. So that is that. Please support our students. Um, they are nice. Uh, I am not biased. They're the greatest of all time. Um, all right. So, our lesson today. I'm sure all of us have played hide and seek. And if you're like me, um, you may have a group of friends that you play hide and seek with all the time. I did growing up, and we'd always play in our neighborhood. And the thing about playing hide and seek in the same place all the time is when you are the seeker, you know where to look. You know where the good hiding spots are, or, you know, hey, I know Trevor pretty well. He probably hides, he's probably going to hide under the pew. So that's where I'm going to look first. Or I know Brinley pretty well. She's probably going to crawl under a couch. I'll look there, right? And there's a character in the Bible named Jonah. And God asked Jonah to do something, and Jonah thought he could outwit God and hide. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> now, this is what happens when you get old kids, you fall. Um, but I'm hidden, for the most part, except for those 
that can see me on the side, this probably looks even more silly. But <clears throat> another reason why this is silly is while I can't see you and you can't see me, you still know exactly where I am. And that is about what Jonah looked like when he tried to hide from God. Another way to think of it, Trevor, this analogy is for you, is like a turtle. What do turtles do when they get scared or frightened? They go in their shell. Now they can't see you, and for the most part you can't see the turtle, but you know exactly where it is. God made every crevice of land and every part of the world. So of course, when Jonah thought he could outsmart God and go and hide, God knew exactly where he was. And so, while Jonah was out at sea, God made a storm, and it rocked the boat, and all the people on the boat were like, why is this happening? And Jonah explained to them that he was hiding from God, and so they were like, you aren't so smart, so why don't you just go ahead and jump off her boat so this will stop. He jumped off the boat, and God had a fish grab Jonah. And he put Jonah in time out for a little bit in a fish's belly so Jonah could think about um, how foolish he had been. And after a while, Jonah had come to his senses and, said, and prayed and asked God for forgiveness. And he said, okay, God, I'm ready to do what you called me to do. And he delivered God's message to the people of Nineveh. Now, a lot of us probably don't know what it means to hide from God, but God is the King of kings, Lord of lords, and in terms of hide and seek, he is the master seeker. So we can't hide from him. And Jonah learned that the hard way. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for allowing us to gather here. I pray that uh, we take this lesson and we're able to learn something from it and use it throughout our week. In your name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the second chapter beginning with the first verse, when the writer writes these words. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the wine that had been turned the the water that had been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he took the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This is the first of the miraculous signs Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Let us pray. Now, O oh God, we ask that all the meditations of our hearts and the words of thy servant find acceptance in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. For it's in his holy name we humbly pray. Amen. I have a good friend who shared with me that that light on his wife's dashboard that comes on and lets one know that they are low on fuel didn't do her any good. She felt like it was just a suggestion. And that, hey, when it was convenient in four or five days, 
she might go and put some gas in the car. My friend said he was always amazed how she would push that car on the fumes in order to drive it as far as she could. And he always pictured her somewhere stranded out on the side of the road when she ran out of gas. Several years later, after they'd been married, had children, they got a new car. And new cars today, we know, they don't just have some vague warning light. They've got those trip computers built into them. It'll tell you how many miles to empty. One morning, my friend said he got up in in the car because his wife said he was to take the children to school. And it said he had two miles until it was empty. I share this story with you. Because I don't think what my friend's wife did is that much out of the ordinary. I think it's pretty normal. I think all of us have certain dimensions of our lives where we run on fumes. And we push the envelope and we ignore the warning signs until we're almost at the point of empty. This is how many of us run our lives, and we're about to see how this all applies in the Gospel of John, a life where things run out. The miracle of water into wine, the Episcopalians think it's the crowning achievement of the Gospel. The Baptists think maybe it was water into grape juice. Presbyterians wanted to know how did Jesus do it so they could replicate it so they could make money off of it. But we all at one point or another have put a different spin on how we are to understand this story of Jesus turning water into wine. It's one of the most perplexing stories in the New Testament. For when Jesus heals someone, no one questions or asks Jesus how he did it. When Jesus raises someone from the dead, no one questions and asks him why he did it. But what's the motive here? What is Jesus trying to do? Well, in verse 11 of our text, the gospel writer John tells us, that this is the first of many miraculous signs that we'll get to see in the life and the encounter with Christ. All of our lives are filled and saturated with all different kinds of signs. And the signs themselves may not be all that significant, but you see, the one thing about a sign is, what does that sign mean? signify. Let me see if I can give you an example. A few days ago, I'm sure you're like me, you watched the college football national championship, and as soon as the game was over, these air cannons began shooting out confetti, and all the Alabama players began to celebrate. The first thing they did was run over to the sideline and get a bunch of $10 t-shirts and hats that said, history made national champions. Now, if you go back in time and talk to a little 10-year-old boy who was going to dedicate his whole life, every waking hour and moment, to actually being a football player at this level, if you were to ask that little boy, what is the first thing you're going to do when you win that football game? It would be surprising, I think, for us to hear The most important thing for me is I'm going to get a T-shirt and a hat. For you see, the important thing is not the T-shirt and the hat. It's it's what the T-shirt and hat symbolize. It symbolizes that you are a champion, that you have accomplished something. It's a symbol for all the work and effort that you have done because now you have experienced what you had dreamed of since 10 years old. You see, one of the most beautiful things about signs is that they point us in the direction of where 
we are supposed to go. So I want to invite you, let's together see if we can find out what the sign is, which is famous here, we know it, water into wine. But more than that, not just discovering what the sign is, what is its significance? Well, the significance, believe it or not, is rooted in the fact that this is a wedding ceremony. And they're in day three of what would have been a week-long celebration. And it, the third day to run out of wine was not a minor social mishap. It would have been a source of great shame to a family who was dealing with this. And about halfway through that wedding celebration, the text says they discover there's no more wine. We're out. I want to pause here just for a moment. And I want to ask you a very pointed question. What is it that you're running out of in your life right now? In the midst of this pandemic, are you running out of patience, kindness, gentleness? Or maybe you're just running out of willpower. Or maybe you're running out of options. Or maybe the one thing that you are doing and the one thing that you're running out the most of is hope. Well, back in 2019, before the pandemic, it was, so it's pre-pandemic, we all know who the millennials are. Well, they did a study and asked 20 and 30-year-olds a series of questions, and they were shocked by what they discovered. 80% of those 20 and 30-year-olds said that they pretty well did not feel good in most every, every, every aspect of their life. 80% said they didn't feel good about most aspects of their life. And then four out of five felt overwhelmed. Not by a particular task or things to do, but they said they were overwhelmed by life itself. And you see here for us, one of the things that is different about the gospel from all the self-help books that you can buy at Barnes and & Noble and pop psychology is we don't tell people that they're not good enough or don't be overwhelmed, and if you are, just use these tools. Instead, we say, of course, sometimes you feel you're not good enough. Because according to the scriptures, we all fall short of the glory of God. And we don't say in the church, of course you feel overwhelmed. And you know the reason sometimes we feel overwhelmed? is because we were never meant to do life alone. We were always created to be dependent upon God, to let God help fill our lives. You see, what we need to discover in the good news of the gospel, the thing that the sign is pointing to us in this text is significance. Why Jesus is try what Jesus is trying to tell us all the way back to the beginning of creation is that emptiness, emptiness becomes abundance. That with God, in those moments when you don't feel like you're good enough, in those moments when you feel overwhelmed, those are the moments that Almighty God shows up with the sweet abundance of His goodness and grace. A colleague of mine had his daughter to get married several years ago. A huge wedding, and he was a pastor. Going to be a wonderful wedding and a beautiful reception. About a week out before the wedding, 
his daughter's fiance was from Canada. On Monday, he emailed him and said, sorry, he could not come today. There were work matters. Then Tuesday came and there was some other excuse. And then Thursday came and she got an email and said, in fact, he's not coming at all. And we all can imagine at that point the devastation of that bride. It was no problem to cancel the wedding because her dad was the pastor. But when it came to the reception, everything was prepaid. So the father and the daughter made a decision. The bride said, I want all of those friends and family to come on, to come together and join me for a celebration anyway. And the day came and they danced and they sang. And then out of nowhere, the bride found the courage to take the microphone. She wanted to thank all her family and friends for the support that they had shown her and how they honored her by coming that evening and to be with her in a very difficult moment. She expressed her gratitude and then she said something that's so true, so true about life. It was all paid for anyway. And you see, beloved, that is the nature of grace. Even in our moments of emptiness, those moments where the abundance of God's goodness and grace comes. For you see, what we discover in this story is that the miracle is found, remember, in those six stone jars. They have been discarded. They have been set aside. They served their purpose. They were there for ritual cleansing. They were there for an ordinary purpose. And Jesus says, fill them to the brim. And when they do, they draw it out. And you heard it in the text. And they save the best for last. The wine was incredible. What's the purpose of this miracle? It seems to me that Jesus is able to take those things that are discarded sometimes, those things that are oftentimes set aside, and he turns them into the glory of God. You see, one of the amazing things about the Gospel of John, it's not just the stories and the encounter that we read themselves but how these stories line up together. If you had your Bible still open, there's another story in the second chapter of the Gospel of John, and I think the writer sandwiched these two stories together with intent. There's this incredible act of grace. There's this moment where Jesus rescues the wedding feast. And then right next door to that story is where Jesus is going to Jerusalem and he goes and he enters the temple and he overturns the tables in anger. Known to us as the cleansing of the temple. When Jesus does this, I think the gospel writer John put these together in such a way, not just chronologically, but for us to be able to notice something. And that is this. If you come to Jesus empty, then he will fill you. But if you come to Jesus full of your wrong, the wrong kind of things like it was in the temple, Jesus will empty them in order to to fill it. If you're like me during the pandemic, I've watched far too much Netflix. Have any of you watched The Crown? Well, in season three, there's an episode. It's called Moondust. And the focus is on Prince Philip. 
And he's at a midlife crisis, and he's presenting, and the presenting issue at the moment in his life is Apollo the 11th. And some of you might have recalled what it was like to gather around television sets and to build the anticipation of what humanity had accomplished. And Prince Philip himself was a pilot, and he had even pushed his own airplane to go high as it could go, far beyond what was recommended. But he was going through a crisis in his life. But it wasn't just any kind of crisis. It was not just psychological. It was spiritual. It was a crisis of faith on the hills that occurred in his life on the heels of his mother's death. And Prince Philip, in the midst of all this, welcomed a new dean, a new pastor into the royal family. And this new pastor who came that Prince Philip welcomed to the royal family was a person who was an expert on helping people focus on restoring their lost faith people who were even supposed to model their faith. And there's a scene. And Philip gets to the point where all the adventure that has occurred in his life, it all collides with the emptiness. And he goes before a group of clergy. With humility, this is what he says. There was not a specific moment when it all started. It has been more of a gradual thing, drip, 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 of doubt, disease, and discomfort. People have, around me have noticed my increased irritability. Now, of course, that is nothing new, but even I have to admit, it's more than it usually is. And when you look at all the symptoms, you realize I'm in a crisis And of course, other people have heard about hitting that kind of crisis. And Prince Philip says, just like them. You start doing all the usual things you do, and you go to all the usual places that you usually go, and you resort to all the things that you can think of to help make yourself feel better. And he says, it's hard, he says, in a room of clergy, some of which I can admit to my crisis in this room, but others I cannot. He says, my mother died recently, and she saw something amiss in me before her death. She saw something that was missing in me, her youngest son. She said, son, how is your faith? She asked, How is your faith? And he said, you know, I had to admit to you that I have lost it. And without it, what is there? He said, all I feel is the loneliness and the emptiness and the anticlimax going of three astronauts all the way to the moon to find something that is haunting. He said, really what I'm trying to say is this, is that the solution to our problems, I think, is not found in ingenuity, a rocket, science, or even technology, or even bravery. No, the answer is here. And he points to his heart, and he points to his head. He said, because it is in our heart and in our mind. That's the place where faith resides. And he said, I've sit here and watched Dean Woods ridicule others. But yet in this moment, I now find myself so full of respect and admiration For now, like others who have entered this room, I can say what they have said. Help me. Help me. 
and to admit why three astronauts deserve our praise and respect for their heroism. To be honest, I was more scared to come in this room before you than I would to be going up in a rocket. Beloved Prince Philip comes to the point where all the adventure, all the exercise, and all those usual things that he did to fill his life, to distract him from the emptiness that was there. From all the grief and the sorrow from his mother's death, and all of that, he says in that moment that he was left with, was emptiness desperation and being in the midst of a clergy group and saying help me remember what I said earlier come to Jesus full and he'll have to empty you of those things that don't need to be there in order to fill you you see, we live in an age that is fascinated with technology and adventure, excitement, achievement, all those things that we try to fill our lives with. But the truth of the matter is this, and hopefully we all discover it in this first miracle at Cana of Galilee, that all those things that we so often try to fill our life with, they will not give you the life-giving faith that comes from Jesus Christ. In fact, Mary, the mother of Jesus, only appears two times in the Gospel of John. And the one we read today, and the other place his mother is found, it's at the end of Jesus' life. And you know where his mother is? She's at the foot of the cross where Jesus is hanging there for the sins of the world. And it's in that moment that Jesus provides for her and the emptiness of himself, the emptiness of himself becomes the fullness is what is available not only for her but for us. And Paul says it this way. He counted equality not a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being found in human likeness and being born in human form. He emptied himself out and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Beloved, Jesus emptied himself in order that you and I might be full. So what do we do with this? Maybe this morning you're in a place of emptiness. Maybe you're in a place of fullness and abundance. But in the meantime... Regardless of what you're feeling, what do we do while we wait? We wait and we listen to what Mary tells those servants to do. Do whatever he tells you to do, she says. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. In other words, we are called to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are called to be generous, to be forgiving, to provide for your family as Jesus provided in this text for his mother Mary and for what he did for all of us upon that cross. We are called to love and to respect and to be patient and to be good and to be faithful to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile. We pray and we wait with longing. 
we do all these things because that's what Jesus, according to Mary, he says. Mary says, do whatever my son tells you to do. So I want to leave you with this thought. Whether you're empty, full, do whatever he tells you to do. And by the way, my friend said, I think I'll go put some gas in the car. Let us pray. Eternal God, we are incredibly grateful for the sign of what happened at that wedding feast. And God, we long for the true wedding feast that you say is coming in the book of Revelation. A true wedding where humanity and your own presence become one. We thank you that we get to be the bride you cherish, the party that you rescue, and even our emptiness becomes our sweet abundance. So, Father, I pray this morning for anyone who's stuck in the middle of that emptiness, who feels overwhelmed by life, or maybe he or she feels like that they're not good enough. But I also pray, God, for those who are full, people who are full of themselves, full of activities. And we pray, God, that whatever we are, that eventually we find ourselves on our knees in celebration that the best came at the last, the moment when your sweet abundance of grace and goodness overflowed. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Much more to the story than we probably thought at first glance. Remember, emptiness becomes our abundance. In whichever way God has spoken to your heart, I always, as we stand and sing our hymn of consecration, I invite you to respond in whatever way God's Spirit is leading you. And we continue to sing once again out of our theme song with these series of messages, Here I Am, Lord. So will you stand with me? Once again, during these series of messages, we continue with the same unison benediction as our acolyte comes. I'm sure none of you will watch football this afternoon or this evening. It's okay on your way out to tell who you're rooting for. 
Will you join with me now? Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.